So this year, we had an idea of trying something new, um, an interdisciplinary dialogue. So what, who we have here on stage is on the one hand, Constantia Alexandru from the University of Cyprus, and she's doing real hardcore physics, quantum chromodynamics. So I actually have a, actually have a PhD in theoretical physics. I never even got close to this level. I'm only a theoretical biophysicist, um, but Constantia is a real theoretical physicist. And Petros is a former chair of the Prey SSC, professor at ETH Zurich, and he is definitely not doing quantum chromodynamics. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so our idea here is that we are going to have Petros interview Constancia about all these things that I would like to know about quantum chromodynamics. That how can you even compute theory in the first place? Can we let a computer decide what's true or not? And are computers really changing theoretical physics? I realized I knew theoretical physics really well, but it was like 25 years ago, and that's probably sadly a different generation. So it's great to have both of you here, and I think we're going to the plan is to start to have Constantia give a short introduction, 15 minutes or so, and then we're going to have Petros take the interview. It's great to have you both here, so welcome. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to be here and try this, uh, also for me, new forum of uh, uh, presenting uh, some of our work. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so let me start uh, by giving you a, an introduction uh, to um, what we do in Lattice QCD. And um, I hope I, uh, I can be uh, understandable uh, to many of you. Uh, but if I fail, please uh, ask questions. Um, so uh, let me uh, start with an overview of what forces we believe, fundamental forces, um, there are in the universe, and uh, uh, you, you all know gravity, of course, and you all know electromagnetism. We have another two, which maybe they are, are less familiar, the weak, what we call a weak nuclear force, and what we call a strong nuclear force. And my task today is to concentrate and describe uh, the strong nuclear force. So we will concentrate on this fourth force here, uh, which it's very important for some of the phenomena that are happening um, in the universe. So the strong force, what is a strong force? The strong force is what binds uh, protons and neutrons into the nucleus, um, which, for, oh, I'm sorry, I went forward, uh, which forms uh, the atoms, the atoms we are all made of. Uh, so if I take this, which is, uh, as you see, four order magnitudes smaller than the uh, typical atom, uh, this nucleus consists of uh, protons and neutrons. Uh, and these protons and neutrons, they are not fundamental. We believe that they are made of particles called quarks. So uh, what we believe uh, today is that quarks at the smallest con constituents of fundamental matter. So we can, there is nothing beyond those three particles as far as we know today. So here is a quark, uh, and uh, the strong force, just to get the perspective, it's about 100 times stronger than electromagnetism. And protons and neutrons are collectively called nucleons. So I will call them nucleons. Uh, these are protons or neutrons. And are about a thousand times heavier than electrons. And because we are all made of atoms, it means that most of our mass comes from these particles. So if we understand the properties of these particles, we understand uh, most of the material we are made of. Okay, so our current view of the universe is sort of schematically shown here. And as, as I said, the bulk of the visible matter, what we call visible matter, is made out of nucleons. And therefore, understanding the structure of the nucleons teaching us about the visible matter. So that's why it's important to understand the structure. Also, understanding the properties of the nucleons uh, help us to design experiments to search for the so-called dark matter. So for the rest, 
of the percentage of the universe. So this is why it's important to understand their structure. So I hope I convince you now that I want to understand the structure of these fundamental particles. And this is a mathematical theory that describes the way the quarks interact. This is a relativistic gauge theory that is called quantum chromodynamics. In Greek, chroma means color. So that's where the theory comes from because these quarks um, that I schematically show here, there are six of them, as you see. Uh, they come in different flavors, up, down, strange, charm, top, and bottom. They are all colored. Color is a quantum number, it's a new quantum number. And it can come in three colors. For, the, for example, the, our proton uh, is shown here. It consists of a U, uh, an up, up, down quark. And they have different colors, and the combination gives a colorless state. And all states that we observe are colorless. This is the first message, they're colorless objects. Right, so uh, this is what we believe. Uh, and you see little uh, strings tightening them. These are the gluons. This is the other fundamental degrees uh, that go into the theory. So we have the six quarks and we have the eight gluons, which are also charged, uh, charged with color, and they are interacting uh, among them. So this is different from the photons that you know from electromagnetism because you know photons do not interact because otherwise light would not be able to reach us from the sun if these uh, photons were interacting. But gluons do interact. Okay, so uh, what are the fundamental properties of this theory? Well, it has two very uh, important properties which are different from electromagnetism. One is called confinement. What does it mean? It means that quarks can never be liberated. So this is the first physical system that we encounter that we cannot be broken. You know, up to now we could uh, take the electron out of uh, an atom and release it. We could take the protons and the neutrons out of the nucleo uh, nucleons and, and and observe them. This is the first physical system that we reach that it can never be broken. However much energy, how, whatever we do, we cannot release these quarks. And this is why it's a fascinating system and very different from everything we know up to now. The other property um, that was discovered by these uh, three gentlemen here is called asymptotic freedom. What does it mean? It means that if I put a lot of energy, if these quarks have a lot of energy, they interact uh, less than when they don't. In other words, if I go to very short distances, these quarks behave as free particles. So this is called asymptotic freedom. And this is a property, again, which is unique for this theory. Right, so let's uh, try and understand a little bit more why this theory is unique and why we, dif we need different methods to study it as compared to electromagnetism, or if we quantize the theory, quantum electrodynamics. So let's take the, our hydrogen atom. Everyone, everybody knows the hydrogen atom. It consists of a proton and an electron going round. Okay, and let's calculate its mass. Well, here is the mass of the electron. Here is the mass of the proton. It's some units, it doesn't matter, but you see the numbers. You add them up. And, and the mass of this particle is the sum plus a tiny little bit. Uh, mega compared to electron volts is ten, 10 to the three. So it's a tiny correction compared to the sum of the masses, okay? Let's go to our proton. Well, in the same units, here is 4.4, 4.4, uh, 
seven for the down core, so we have twice this plus this. This is, you know, about 12. But look at the mass. It's, a thou it's almost a 1,000 times more. So this system is completely different from this. This is a huge interaction energy, which comes from the interaction between the particles. So the mass of these particles, or the mass we are made of, it comes almost um, totally from interactions. That's why this is a very complicated system, and this is why we need different methods to calculate it. So it's all interaction. It's all the strong interaction. Okay, so how do we solve the theory? The only way we know how to solve the theory today, starting from the fundamental Lagrangian of the system, which is this thing um, written here. You see, you can write it in one line. Uh, the, here are my six quarks. Here are my gluons, okay? So I have six parameters to input, the mass of the quarks and the coupling constant. After I input, oh, after I, we, I input these parameters, everything else is determined. So everything should be a prediction. I take the theory, which is um, defined in, in continuum uh, space-time, and I discretize it, and I put it on a lattice. I, defi I define the quarks on the lattice, on the lattice sides here. Ah, I'm doing it wrong. Uh, uh, on the lattice sides, and I'm defining the, uh, the gluons on the links. And then uh, I have, um, I, I, I want to calculate something which exp experimentally is going to measure, so it's an expectation value, uh, and I do it by doing a simulation. Okay, so I simulate uh, the gauge configurations, and I measure an expectation value. Very nice. Uh, so lattice QCD actually connects to many experiments because I will measure this observable, and then I'm, I'm going to go and compare of what experimentalists are going to be measuring. And what I will be describing to you is mostly hadron structure, so this part of what lattice QCD can do. Right. So uh, how do we solve lattice QCD? We, we, Discretize the theory, now we can put it on the computer. So we use normally leadership computers, and here I'm showing you that algorithmic improvement is extremely important. So if we have not done any algorithmic improvements, we will be on this line, and you see its order of magnitudes uh, that we are due to uh, algorithmic um, improvements that we are doing. And uh, we have to face several critical uh, components. Uh, I'm giving you one example. One of the bottlenecks in these calculations is um, uh, the so-called um, critical slowdown because I have to invert a very big matrix. It's um, 10 to the 9 times 10 to the 9, but it's... Uh, uh, almost diagonal, it's a sparse matrix, uh, but its condition number gets worse if I lower the masses of my quarks. Okay, so I have to deal with this critical uh, slowdown, and you see that if I do, I, uh, um, I mean, I have to do, I have to solve a linear equation, and if I use conjugate gradient, this is the dependence of the mass, and I have to be here, this is a uh, mass that I, I told you of the down and the, and the up quark. And you see that um, I have a problem because uh, the, the time to inversion increases. Whereas if I do now uh, something called multigrid, I, I obtain uh, almost no dependence. So this is uh, the kind of improvements, just to give you, give you a flavor, that we are doing in order uh, to enable our calculations. And uh, here is uh, the speed up we get. Uh, the uh, this is strong scaling uh, using uh, Pistain uh, GPU. So you see, uh, this would be the optimal. And here we are almost optimal uh, in the way the scaling codes go. Right. So 
here it is, it's a plot summarizing the state of our simulations in lattice QCT. And you see uh, many names here. These are uh, lattice QCT collaborations that are doing these simulations. These have been done worldwide, from Japan to United States to Europe. Uh, and what you see, you see many, many points here. And this is where we were five years ago. Five years ago, we couldn't be at the physical up and down quark masses, which is this line here. This is where the physical world is. And you see now, recently, we, are, we have approached it, and you see many collaboration now are sitting on this line. And here is a lattice spacing, which has to be small enough in, all, in order to have continued physics. And you see again, as we go in this direction, we hit continued physics. So now, this is a breakthrough of lattice QCD. We are here. We are simulating the physical world. So this is a breakthrough. Uh, this is where we want to be. And now, uh, the real fun starts. Right. So some results, because I don't have a lot of time, I will go pretty fast now, just to give you a flavor. So if we do all these simulations and we calculate the observables, what do we get? Well, this is, a, uh, again, a breakthrough calculation by the BMW collaboration. It's not a car. It starts for Budapest, um, Marseille, Wuppertal collaboration. Uh, and here uh, you see the uh, masses of the long-line uh, particles. So these are particles we observe experimentally. And here is the prediction of lattice QCD, the red points. And you see, they all agree with the experiment. This was a breakthrough. It was 10 years ago. It's a science paper. It was a breakthrough. We can reproduce the masses of known particles. Right. Now I show you something a little bit more complicated. This is state of the art. This is using um, simulations at the physical point of something called form factors. Form factors probe the structure, oops, the structure of this uh, proton. So I hit it with an electron, and I observe how this electron scatters. And from the scattering properties, I determine uh, these quantities. And here is experiment, and here is our calculation. So there are small deviations. So this is what we, we would, would like to understand. Um, but note here, for example, for the, for the neutron, this quantity, this is the electric form factor, already uh, we have lattice data which are more accurate than experiments. This is the first message. You will get the lattice data now that are more accurate than experiments. Now, the slope of these form factors gives you how large the particle is. And we have a puzzle now. We have a puzzle. Uh, scientists measured in, at PSI in Switzerland the, how big the proton is using ionic atoms. And they found that it's different from the size we measure from electron scattering experiments by seven more, uh, uh, almost eight standard deviations. This is a big number for physics. Okay? And the task is to understand uh, whether there is a discrepancy or not, and whether lattice QCT can provide an input. To do that is a challenge uh, uh, because we have to get a very accurate result. And this is one of the things that, we, uh, that is, on, is progressing. So now let, uh, let me come to the proton spin puzzle. This is another puzzle that was around since 1980. Seven, uh, there was an experiment at CERN that measured the spin carried by the quarks, these three quarks. And at that time, we thought, here are my three quarks. I have, uh, they have spin one half each. So two spin ups, one down, should give me one half. Plus one, plus one half, minus one half is one half. OK, very simple. This is what we thought. They measured it, and they found instead one-fourth and not one-half. So this was called the spin 
puzzle of the, of the proton. So who carries the proton spin? Well, now we know the vacuum is very complicated. It's not a vacuum. This is a quantum field theory. It has quarks and antiquarks popping up from the vacuum, and it has gluons. So we have to calculate the contribution of these quarks and antiquarks and the gluons to the spin. And this is what we set out to do on Pistain. OK, so I'm coming to the end. So this is a calculation we did. Uh, we, we took the simulations that were done on Uqueen and SuperMOOC. We fed them to um, uh, Pistain. And why did we feed them into Pistain? Because we wanted to calculate these so-called discollected diagrams, which needed GPUs. So the only way to do it was to use GPUs. OK, so we did that. Uh, and this is the time we used uh, on, GP, uh, on, on Pistain, so 5% of the machine for one year. And these are the numbers we got. The numbers don't, don't matter. What matters, I mean, this, for example, I highlight here, this is due to the strange quark. The strange quark, there was no strange quark in the proton. I told you it's up and down. The strange quark comes from the vacuum. It pops up, quark and the quark pops up from the vacuum, and it's real, and we have calculated it. And this is a number, and it's not zero, okay? So it contributes to the spin of the, uh, of the proton. So you get these numbers, and you think, aha, these are all random numbers. And it, there are, in some sense, they are scale dependent. They can change. But when you add them up, it is one half, as it should be, because it's a quantum field theory. If it was not one half, we are in trouble. And you see also there is a non-zero contribution coming from the gluons. So the gluons are real. We don't see them because they are confined forever, but they are real, and they contribute to the spin. OK? So if you add them up, you get one half. And now we understand it, because if you look at this graph, now these are the quarks. This is the gluon. And what experimentalists had measured was this thing here. And the rest is this here, which is about the half is the same. This is about the same. And this contributes and becomes one half. So using Pistain and large scale simulations, we managed to solve the problem that was around uh, since 1987. And these are my collaborators uh, in this work. So I would like to conclude by saying we're looking forward to exascale computing because we believe we can learn even more about this system. And I thank you for your attention. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for this very insightful presentation, at least for other people, not for me, but that's oh. another question. <laughs> but so uh, as uh, Eric said earlier, this is the, the first time that we do this. And actually, I, I, I have some anxiety here. It's the first time I do that. So I will start with some easy questions. So Eric is from Sweden. We are in Switzerland. Tomorrow there is the game. Who do you think is going to win the game, Sweden, Switzerland? Oh, I would, I would not, I don't want to uh, take a bet on this one, you Petros. Don't take so a, no, okay. no. Who's going to win the World, Cup, the World Cup, my second question? Uruguay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We Ura can, I like Uruguay. So. You like Uruguay. We yeah. can keep going like that, actually. But <laughs> maybe <laughs> we will not get dinner if we go on like that. So I, uh, I, I was actually very intrigued by your presentation, especially um, it's actually always interesting to see simulations and to see error bars around simulations. Um, very often when you do a simulation, it's something which is usually deterministic, you run the simulation, you get a number, um, usually. Uh, so I was wondering these error bars that you had around your simulations, where do they come from? OK, these are statistical error bars. So we do a Monte Carlo. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know this is your producer representative uh, um, ensemble. So you have to calculate the errors. So the, 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 the errors that I, I give, they are of two types. So they're the statistical one, which we more or less understand how to calculate. 
But then you have your systematic errors. And of course, the systematic errors are much more difficult to calculate. And systematic errors come from various sources. It can come because you have a finite lattice spacing. Mm -hmm. As I said, I didn't have a lot of time to explain this. But you do the simulation at the given lattice spacing. And then in the end of the day, you want to take the continuum limit, which you means you have to do the, sim the calculation at several values of this lattice spacing and then extra extrapolate to zero. So this, this has a systematic error. And this we have not done in this calculation because we use only one lattice spacing. So mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not a continuum calculation yet. Then there is a finite volume because you have a finite uh, box. You put, you know, so this is another systematic error. And then there are some other not so obvious systematic errors, um, which I haven't described here. OK. So if, uh, if, uh, if it, I mean, would you like these error bars to diminish? Or do you think yes. it's possible um, to diminish these error bars? Or, or what would you need in order to reduce the size of these error bars? I mean, I, I, my second question was, you said, look at that, we get 1 half. But you were actually with, getting, with an error, with you an getting error. 0 0.54, which with is about 10% exactly. uh, yes. off, yes. Uh, which yes. um, given that this is a very precise theory, et cetera, I was wondering, what, what do you need in order to get okay. the 0 so 0.54? First is the statistical error. And this, uh, the way to, um, to do this is to increase statistics. Mm -hmm. So run the calculation for longer and increase statistics. So this is one way to cut the error, square root of n. We know how this behaves. The systematic error, you have to, as I said, goes to a smaller lattice spacing. You, you need at least three, so you do, and then extrapolate. Then you will know the systematic error due to the lattice spacing. You have to do a fine, uh, an infinite volume extrapolation. Mm -hmm. And then there are other systematic errors, uh, like you create these particles and you let them propagate. And as they propagate, um, uh, your signal dies exponentially, mm -hmm. but your noise is constant. So you, you are fighting all the time uh, the, the error as your signal dies down. Now, you have to propagate enough in order to be in the state that you want to calculate, the, the proton or the neutron. Uh, so this is a difficulty in lattice QCD, and we always have to fight that. We have to go far enough to be sure that we are detecting the particle we want, but on the same time, your error grows uh, exponentially compared to your signal. Mm -hmm. So uh, it means that we need more and more statistics as we go to larger distances. So this is a, another systematic error that we have to take into account. Mm -hmm. But so, yeah. this will come with uh, bigger statistics. OK. So you have error bars in your simulations. The experimentalists also have error bars. Um, I presume the sources of the error bars for the two things, as you describe, are different. They are different. Uh, and, 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 and so who should have bigger error bars, you or them? It, well, it depends on the quantity. I mean, some quantities. Um, as I shown, I mean, uh, experimentalists have more accurate results. In others, we now start to have more accurate results. So it depends on the quantity, really. I, so I don't so think can I pick on this statement? So you said actually during your talk, lattice data now are becoming more accurate than experiments. For some quantities. For some quantities. And then there's other places where experiments are more accurate than so who tells us uh, about this accuracy? Who tells us who is more accurate? Is there some underlying truth? And we know that the experiments are more accurate, the simulations are more accurate. H how do we, I, I have well, a hard for, time for, to. For, for example, there are some quantities exper experiments cannot measure very well. For example, if you have an unstable particle, uh, you cannot make a beam out of, an, uh, of unstable particles. So if you want to calculate the form factors of an unstable particle, experimentalists will have difficulties. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, in lattice QCD, we have a chance to calculate these quantities. So there are different quantities that lattice QCD can calculate more accurately than experiments. So it depends on the quantity, really. There is not a okay. uniform, and uh, one unique answer here, I, I believe. And then you decide a priori, or you know a priori, experimentalists cannot do that. We can do that, and vice versa. S something like that, yes. Is there yes. ever a time that both of you calculate the same quantity? And in this case, 
Oh yes, yeah. so, yeah, I mean the pump factor, for example, the, the electric pump factor, we calculate and they calculate and we can compare di directly and we can reduce the errors and they have very tiny errors. Uh, so there, there is, um, that's what I'm saying, the, the radius, uh, the charge radius of the proton is calculated very accurately by the experimentalist. Mm -hmm. And we are not at that precision yet, we, at in, in Lattice QCD. The hope is, uh, that's why I'm saying, if we have exascale, uh, we can reduce the errors and then be able to uh, say which of these measurements is a correct one, because now there is a disagreement uh, between them. So if there is a disagreement uh, between experiments and simulations. No, no, these are two experiments which okay. disagree. Are two experiments that disagree. Yes. But probably you have also simulations that disagree with experiments, or you oh, never yeah, have yes, I, I have, uh, yeah, yes, well, so okay. how do, my question is, how do we proceed in this case? Who do we believe? So what I showed you, I showed you some results where Radis QCD was deviated a little bit from experiment, right? However, we have not done the, fo the full analysis because we have only done it at one lattice basis. So as I said, to be sure that we have a discrepancy, we have to take the continuum limit and we have to take the infinite volume limit. If we do this and we still disagree, then we have a problem, I would okay. say. But we are not there yet. We're not there yet. Okay. So um, if I can, I mean, we are both kind of, uh, well, we have some philosophical history, etc. So if I want to take this um, uh, a little bit in the philosophical direction, so is it possible to know what you can predict or, and what you cannot predict? before you start a simulation, or when you produce a simulation, produces a result uh, well, for well, something that there is no experiments? How do you trust it? Well, the f as I said, the first thing you do is validate what you know. Sure. Okay, so if I calculate a mass and, uh, and I, I, I get the right result, and then if I calculate a mass of a different particle, actually there is an example of this, the omega, the, the, the um, uh, with, the, with strange quarks, um, I mean, Lattice QCD predicted it, and experimentalists then found it. So if you can calculate the masses that I showed and reproduce experiment, then you believe that you can calculate another mass of a particle that has not been observed and uh, give this as a prediction, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, there are some quantities in Lattice QCD that we know we cannot calculate. Uh, because we cannot calculate all the energy levels. We cannot go up to, I mean, to do, for example, to cal uh, calculate a scattering cross-section in Lattice QCD. It, well, right now we don't know how to do it because you, you will need to calculate a lot of energy, energy uh, levels. And what Lattice QCD does very well is to calculate low and line energy levels. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this answers your question. No, it's, it's fine. So, so there, is this, uh, there is a quote that I used it once, and uh, as a computational person, I got into a lot of trouble from my experimental colleagues. Uh, this is a statement by Sir Arthur Eddington, and he said, experimentalists will be surprised to learn that we will not accept any experimental evidence that is not confirmed by theory. What is your opinion about that <sighs> statement? Well, I don't know. I mean, I find it surprising that an experimentalist actually said something like this, and in particular, a famous experimentalist. Um, I mean, in principle, we are open to an experiment finding something which does not ag agree with, exp uh, with the theory, because then uh, this may t uh, teach us something new. And we know examples in physics that this has happened. The Michelson ex experiment was one of them. Um, so I'm a bit surprised, actually, that... Uh, but, but how do you distinguish that when an experiment, you, an experiment is working, they produce something, if they don't have a theory of why this is happening, how do you decide to trust them or not? Well, if why they should have we done always if try they, to change uh, okay, our simulations course, to... Look, if, if, if there is an experiment that disagrees with the electromagnetism, which is a well-established theory, then the, there are going to be lots of cross, cross checks. So somebody is going to repeat the experiment independently. More groups will do an experiment in different ways. 
using different approaches. Uh, and then if all these approaches give the same result and disagrees with the electromagnetic result, then we have to think. But, uh, you know, it's very difficult uh, to accept a, an experiment that deviates from a theory that has been tested and, and stand, uh, stood to the, to the test. Uh, but it could happen because, uh, because we know, for example, the standard model uh, may not be the full story. And in fact, people are looking for deviations from the standard model experimentally. So if we, if we see something which deviates from the standard model, and this is confirmed to the accuracy that we need, which is five sigma, six sigma, and uh, other groups also confirm this, then we take it seriously. And then we have to ask uh, whether, whether we have to have a different dis theoretical description. So... Okay. So, um, so you, you mentioned also that uh, we are doing predictions and also you said that this is fundamental research so that you're doing, um, that you care about a lot, about understanding. Uh, these days there is all these um, discussions about data and then we can give data to a machine learning and then the machine learning can uh, do predictions for us. Um, uh, so one question based on your um, experience is um, if we are able to predict something, do we need to understand it also? If I'm able to predict the weather, uh, um, a more general question, do I need to understand what look, causes the weather? I, 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 I think so. I mean, look. I and mean, and we, why? Uh, I mean, we, we knew that the spin of the proton is one half. Nobody doubted this. It's one half, we know it. The question is, do we understand how it comes about? And this was the question. I mean, uh, is it, does it come from the uh, valence cork? Does it come from the glue? Does it, because this also uh, teaches you about the dynamics of the theory. So just knowing a number is not enough, I think. You have to understand the mechanisms uh, of giving rise to this number. So this, this I think, is uh, the fundamental questions we are trying to address. So, so you're, you're saying that predicting is not enough. We need to understand well, no matter what. That's your feeling or your thinking. Well, it is, uh, I don't know. I mean, predicting is very important. To predict is very important, of course, right? I'm not underestimating. Prediction is very important. But, uh, uh, also, understanding how this comes about is also very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if this is... No, this is, this is fine. So, so another question, again, on this prediction and, and, and understanding. I guess we, we probe a question through an experiment. We probe a question um, uh, through a simulation. Um, and, and I would like to phrase my question under something that Democritus said. Uh, which is a, a quote that I, I like very much. It says, nothing exists except atoms and empty space. Everything else is an opinion. So, <laughs> so, 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 so are simulations and experiments two different opinions? And when they agree, we agree. Are they opinions? Are they the truth? How do you see that? Oh, Petros, this is a very difficult question. But um, uh, look, what I have shown you is that we have calculated the properties of the most elementary particles that exist, which is what Democritus called the atoms, so the quarks are the equivalent of the atoms, mm -hmm. as far as we know today, and the properties of the vacuum. What I showed you, the strange uh, quark and the gluon is the vacuum, is, in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. It is a vacuum. So, or, yeah, I mean, they, they pop up and so I don't know if this is an opinion. I think not. This, this is the truth, right? This is the truth. Okay. I, uh, I would not know, but. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, so this is the truth. So, so, so you're <laughs> saying that there is perfection. As far as I, as, I, as, far as I am concerned. Okay. <laughs> so, so, uh, so there is perfection and there, there is the truth. So, so what you're saying is that there is a perfect theory and we can have a perfect theory and we are aware of the truth. And when we see it, we can find it through a simulation or perfect. through an experiment. I, I don't know if I say so. As far as we know uh, today, um, 
quantum chromodynamics describes the strong interaction, as far as we know today. Mm -hmm. This is a theory, we believe, uh, describes the world of strong interacting particles. Yeah. So this is as real as you can get, I guess. But if I may push you, I mean, in the last slide, you saw the progress that we have over the years. Yes. So the truth a few years back was somewhere above this black line. And yeah, as but we, we knew this. We knew this. We right? knew that this is not the truth. Exactly. We were computing something oh, yes. and we, we knew this we is not the truth. We absolutely knew that. Because the masses, we knew they were not the right masses. Okay. So um, a question. Um, so again, uh, between simulation and experience. So what is it? that you can say we can learn in general from a simulation that we could not have learned from an experiment? Yeah, okay, so um, for example, in the, in, the, in the case that I have uh, shown you about the spin, some of the quantities that we calculate, like the orbital angular momentum, this, was, uh, this is unknown to, to experiment. Uh, the glue, some of the, I mean, this calculation that we do for the, for the glue, uh, this was not known in experiments. So these are new quantities, and actually there are experiments being planned uh, now. The electron ion collider being planned um, in the US will address some of these questions. So this is the interplay in the uh, between uh, theory and experiment that makes physics. So physics uh, it really goes hand in hand. So experiment measures something, we try to understand it. We make, we make a calculation that predicts something and experiment tr tries to uh, validate it. So I think this is how physics works. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a very nice example of the scientific method and approach. Okay. So um, another question, so, so let's go back to simulations alone. So you mentioned that you make the advances, your, your community makes the advances they make through um, algorithms and at the same time through the advancements in machines. And then you say that this is how much we get from one uh, algorithm, this is how much we get from the machines. Um, but the people who develop the algorithms, are they ever aware or do they take into consideration the machines? for yes. which they're going to, yes. prog to develop algorithms? Yes. Is this yes. happening in parallel in yes, this yes, uh, yes. community? I mean, let us see the people who, uh, who uh, write uh, all these algorithms and, and, and codes, uh, they know very well about uh, computer architectures. Okay, so, so as we're moving to exascale, Yes. Um, there will be more algorithms, or the algorithms yes. we have today well, are good uh, enough for no, exascale. No, no, I, I mean this is a, yeah, of course. Well, I mean otherwise, as you, as you as you have seen, if we relied only on machines, it would be a thousand times behind. So so um, uh, we look forward to having um, new algorithms for our uh, solvers. Um, so we still new, need new algorithms uh, for exascale. Asynchronous, or, or I don't know. That's many ideas, uh, ideas around, uh, also keeping a lot of the calculations in memory and not uh, communicating. So we need to um, uh, make um, improvements uh, as, we, as, as we move forward, and people are thinking uh, about all these improvements. So it's critical for our discussion. So, so I, I, I read over the last Saturday in the NZZ a very nice statement that, that computers are getting faster and slower. And, and I, get to pass uh, slower. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and, and uh, I thought this was interesting. So as they get uh, faster, slower, maybe at some point um, um, we would need something else. And then there are people who are talking about quantum computers, uh, neuromorphic computers, yeah. all sorts of new architectures. Um, is there something that you're thinking that this would be a great future for the field, or well, we uh, get new discoveries, uh, or I? Yeah, I, I get. I have. I have not thought about this a lot, okay. but uh, I guess quantum computers will bring uh, uh, a lot of advantages uh, for co for quantum systems. Okay. So uh, we look forward to that, okay. because one of the biggest problem we have is we cannot simulate the quarks directly because they are fermions. So these are anti-commuting quantities which you cannot represent on a classical computer, right? Mm -hmm. So this, um, I mean, if we were able to do that, then we would have solved uh, QCD, because, because now what we do basically is we integrate out uh, the quarks 
So, so we go from a local theory to a highly non-local theory, and that and this makes the uh, the simulations are uh, much harder. Mm -hmm. So if I may ask you um, maybe uh, some personal questions, uh, like how, how did you end up becoming a scientist and working in this particular area? What, what did you like? What, what was the appealing thing that you can say that okay. uh, <laughs> drove uh, you to study these things? Uh, well, when I was in high school, I wanted, I wanted to do medicine because this is all I knew at that time. And then I found myself in the UK, accidentally. I went there in 1974 to learn English. But then a major thing happened, happened in Cyprus, as you know. Uh, we had an invasion, and I could not go back. So I stayed in the UK. And I found out that um, I liked mathematics and physics much more than I did biology, because biology at that time was taught very differently. So, uh, so I decided maybe medicine was not a good idea, so I, I applied um, to do physics I, uh, and engineering, actually. So I applied to Oxford to do physics and in other schools to do engineering. And um, I was lucky that uh, Oxford accepted me, so that's how I ended up doing physics. So, so uh, since, since you mentioned Cyprus, uh, so why is your work um, uh, important or relevant for the people of Cyprus? When I moved to Cyprus and I made an application uh, for funding, uh, my proposal came last. Uh, and a proposal uh, to distill um, um, alcohol and produce uh, a very well-known uh, liquor in Cyprus called Zivania came first. I, I understand the thinking. Uh, and because <laughs> they said, well, what is the relevant uh, what is QCD? And, uh, and then we made a lot of complaints and our proposals were, were sent uh, outside of Cyprus. And my proposal, I was lucky enough to be top. So it came top and I got the funding. So I started, right? Um, it has been extremely important because if the largest community had not been in Cyprus, we would not have developed uh, supercomputing in Cyprus. I mean, our machines are small, uh, but still we have people that are capable of programming. Um, we were one of the first groups actually to program GPUs. Uh, we started in, two, in 2008, um, and that's how we got to the point we got. And I think uh, we uh, generated this um, idea of supercomputing, and we have a center now uh, where we do interdisciplinary uh, research. Mm -hmm. So this shows that fundamental research, which seemingly has no connection, practical connection, can benefit uh, societies. And uh, I, I really believe this. Uh, I think motivated scientists that are curiosity-driven, um, should be encouraged, they attract talent, first of all, and they uh, create an environment where you build something which benefits uh, everybody in the end of, um, uh, in the, end of the road. So, so as you were um, doing all these great things that you have been doing in, in Cyprus, um, uh, what were some of the biggest challenges that, that you encountered? What would you say were the, both scientifically, socially, um, whatever? Well, the, the, the biggest uh, problem was what you mentioned. I mean, people would say, well, why are you doing this? What is the benefit for Cyprus? You know, and uh, we had to always argue this. I mean, when I arrived in Cyprus, I remember I, I arrived, I mean, Cyprus did not have a university. The university was created in 1993 and we were the first people to go there. We had no library, we had no journals, we had no computers, nothing. When I said R&D, people did not understand. The politicians had no understanding. So this was a very difficult time, okay? Um, and that was the biggest uh, challenge, actually. And what helped us was um, international recognition and, and, and uh, you know, looking outside. Uh, and this helped us a lot to prove that we had some value mm -hmm. in what we were doing. 
So uh, I, I guess um, these um, days our society slowly uh, is recognizing that uh, we need actually more female scientists. And, and uh, you were a female scientist when you were going through all these challenges. And I noticed in one of your slides where you had some collaborators, you had like um, six male uh, scientists and one and female, female scientist. And, and uh, what would you think would be um, how can we encourage more female scientists to get, uh, not necessarily in lattice QCD? Uh, well, I would like to see more in lattice QCD. <laughs> but uh, in, in science in general, in supercomputing, what do you think is missing? What do we do wrong? What could we do better? Well, I, I, I can tell you what I think we... Um, I, I don't know the answer, the full answer to your question. It's a difficult one. I'm still the only female physicist in the department. Um, I mean, Martha Constantino was one of, one of our students, and she's doing very well. She's in the U.S. now. She's an assistant professor in the U.S. Um, what I have seen teaching uh, uh, for so many years is that one of the biggest problems uh, is that there are a lot of uh, very smart uh, women, but somehow the social environment makes them less ambitious than the males uh, uh, in the class. So they want to do some more practical things mm. rather than, phys uh, you know, this uh, theoretical physics, for example. Although they're, they're equally smart as some of the male uh, students are going into the field. And I don't know how to overcome this. I think, I think this is, um, I don't know how to, I mean, you, you, I think you're overcoming it by showing examples of successful women. So I think this is very important. So I mm. think what the US is doing to hire women in academia and in these fields is the right thing because I think uh, when you see other uh, uh, people doing it, you think, oh, maybe it's possible. Uh, maybe it's possible. And I, uh, why not? Why not me doing it? So um, I hope this, this will uh, change as we see more women entering uh, in, in, into these uh, fields. But it takes time. Well, um, I want to thank you very much for uh, tolerating all these uh, well, questions. Thank you, and I, <laughs> and I learned I a lot. I want to <laughs> thank the audience for um, taking the time to be here. And I wish you that uh, may the strong force be with you. <laughs> <laughs>